and some baton gestures again, but this time they're different. You're out of sync. Looking back at them 20 years later. Meaning what he's saying is not really genuine. He doesn't believe in it. This video is gonna be different from my normal videos. I wanna do something different. I've been wanting to incorporate behavior profiling on my channel for some time now. And the past year, year and a half, I started taking classes. And I decided what's the best way to incorporate this into my channel with the first video being about Dan Schneider. To see if he was actually really being genuine on what he was saying, or if he was being deceptive and doing this for publicity to cover his own tail and cut his ties from Nickelodeon giving his own behavioral profile. And I do want to add, the profile I'll be giving Dan Schneider is my own personal opinion. What I'm going to be looking for is stress and discomfort behaviors in clusters. Stress and discomfort behaviors in clusters are more likely to indicate deception in interviews and conversations. With that being said, let's get into today's video. Hey, it's Boogie. I play Tebow on Nickelodeon's iCarly. I got a chance to watch the Quiet On Set program and I reached out to Dan to see if it was something that he'd be willing to discuss. I'm pleased to say that he said yes. Dan, how are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we saw over the last two nights. Now in the first couple seconds of this video, you can see a very comfortable staged environment. And Boogie is a former actor of Dan. In my opinion, Boogie's gonna have some truth bias when he asks these questions and probably help Dan a little bit to answer these questions. Just walk him through it. Dan, how are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we saw over the last two nights. I'm really glad you're here because I believe this is when we first see Dan, Boogie asks him how he's doing and how he's feeling. Now this is the part where the eye thing I was talking about earlier. Dan's eyes dart down to the left, which means internal conversation. Then we see his eyes dart down to the bottom right, the emotional thinking. At the same time we see his eyes dart to the right, we see a lip compression. That's where our two lips right here compress together. And that means hold back an opinion. He's suppressing his opinion. I would also add the way Dan's presenting himself in the beginning. He looks very comfortable and relaxed. His hands are in a downward steeple. He's very engaged with Boogie and he has internal confidence going on during this interview and some self-control. His blink rate is normal. When someone's blink rate is more than 19 blinks per minute, that indicates high stress. Before I dive into my list of topics that I'd like to discuss, is there anything you'd like to start off with? Absolutely. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult. Me facing my past behaviors. Um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret, and I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Here we get an expression of disgust. He is disgusted by what he saw on the documentary going in with an eyebrow flash. Now, eyebrow flash has two different meanings. Now, in this context, he's trying to convey being trustworthy and vulnerable. Then we get another eyebrow flash with a head tilt. This is trying to appear innocent. Now, if you look at it, you can see his blink rate go up than what it was before difficult, me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret, and I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. But then we get a lip compression when he goes to say he owes some people some strong apologies, but then he doesn't apologize. In my opinion, all this was for show. He knew the questions were coming. He's a writer, he's an actor, so he most likely knows how to control his micro expressions and his behaviors to keep everything going. But behaviors leak through over time. You can't keep them in control all the time. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. In this clip where he talks about the massages, we have a lot of behaviors and clusters going on. Look right here where he says wrong. Every time he says wrong, his shoulder, wrong, 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 never. It's a single shoulder shrug. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. This is a single shoulder shrug. This means doubt and disbelief 
in what someone is saying. So in this context, he has doubt and disbelief in what he's trying to convey to us. At the end of the statement, he admits wholeheartedly that he did this out in the open, meaning he saw nothing wrong with this. After he admits that, at the end, he has a slight shoulder shrug, meaning he still believes that. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No, no, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and, and I can tell you why it hurts really bad for me. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences in the entertainment business. I was green. I was scared. I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should have. And I wish I could go back and fix that. Um, in the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far. And um, that was wrong. And that, that was because, you know, I was an inexperienced producer. I was immature. Wouldn't happen today. But um, I'm just really sorry it happened. Yeah. Now, this next part, we get a, hey, let me stop you there, before even Boogie asks the question. Now, as he's doing that, his hand goes up to stop him. It was a stopping gesture. While that's going on, we get a downcast gesture. His head goes down and some eye blocking. A head downcast means a few things, but in this context, he's probably feeling some type of shame or guilt. And then with the eye blocking, as he's saying it, mentally, he doesn't want to relive this part. From my opinion, if Dan didn't stop him and Boogie was able to ask the question about Dan's writer's room, we would have got a different answer. But Dan stopped him before he asked the question to where Dan was able to answer in his own way, to where he was able to control the narrative. When Dan goes to talk about his writer's room, we see a lot of this. And this is when someone needs to seem trustworthy and honest. And then when he goes to explain, we get a lot of hesitancy. And, and I can tell you why it hurts really bad for me. Um, hesitancy takes place when someone's trying to process their story inside their mind. To ensure what they're about to say comes out where they want you to believe it. Jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um, that was wrong and that, that was because, you know, I was an inexperienced producer, I was immature, wouldn't happen today, but um, I'm just really sorry it happened. Yeah. We have a cluster of behavioral gestures here. We have eyebrow flash, open palms, and psychological distancing. And psychological distancing is when they replace a crime or offense with a less severe word. With this cluster, he's trying to get your approval and trustworthiness with the eyebrow flash, using his palms as a gesture to solidify it, calling it a joke, a practical joke to downplay it as if people are making it worse than what it should be. And in that whole statement, he doesn't really apologize to the writers. He only apologizes that it happened. Now we know you've had a lot of success over two decades. Thousands of people have worked with you for you. Okay. Let's speak directly to the people who did not have a good experience with you. Okay, I would like to speak to those people because I hate that anybody worked for me and didn't have a good time. You know me, you've been on my sets. Um, look, I've had some employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20 years, who would work with me again, but um, not everybody. There's a, still a significant number that didn't have a great time working for me so my batting average isn't nearly high enough in that area um, and the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that I would let the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year I would let that pressure get to me which a good boss should never ever do so there specific things that you were doing Sh sure I would um, snap at people sometimes mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have given them a nicer answer um, I would not give people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. And watching that show, it made me, there were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call some of those people and say, I'm so sorry and let's talk about it. And I, I wish you'd had a better time and I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. Now, now, right here, Boogie starts asking about his shows and you can see Dan knows the question's coming up. He goes from a hand steeple 
to a fig leaf and a pacifying behavior. The fig leaf is genital protection. A man will put a hand over his private parts and a female will put a one arm over their ovaries. When this happens, the person's probably feeling vulnerable, threatened, or insecure on what's going on. A pacifying behavior is when someone does something to soothe the feeling of uncomfortability. When Boogie started asking about his shows, Dan started to feel threatened and insecure, moving into that pacifying behavior to calm himself down. And then he goes into a resume statement. You know me, you've been on my sets. Um, look, I've had some employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20 years who would work with me again, but um, not everybody. Resume statement is a way you answer to suspicion or wrongdoing. A way to manage how people see you, telling them about your good qualities. So it will be disbelief to them that you can actually do stuff like this. He looks up Boogie and says, you know me, you've been on my sets. Some people had a great time. And then he goes into that internal conversation, going back to the resume statement right after that a lot of people had a good time and that a lot of people didn't have a good time. And this one word right here gets me. He uses the word significant. A significant amount of people did it. A significant number that didn't have a great time working for me. With him saying that he knows which people didn't have a good time. So at the time he knew which people didn't have a good time and didn't even bring it up then to apologize. Now this last part, I'm not going to get into it. We're going to look at Boogie's reaction to what Dan says. We're going to look at his behavior because this is very interesting. There were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call some of those people and say, I'm so sorry and let's talk about it. And I, I wish you'd had a better time and I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. Now, now I'm getting two different feelings right here. One feeling is that he really didn't believe what Dan was saying because of the lip compression that he gave. The second feeling I'm getting is he's thinking you deliver the answer good. You deliver the answer perfectly. As he's shaking his head with a lip compression, holding back from wanting to say, you did a good job. That was a great answer. You've written hundreds of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. But currently where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny, okay? Um, now we have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show. Just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 years ago. I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like it. The more people who like the show is the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to say with your work, mm -hmm. if it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem Cut it, cut it. I mean, that's a solution. The, the last thing I wanna ever do yeah. is put any content in a show that's gonna upset my audience and make them wanna turn off the TV. Why would I ever wanna do that? That makes sense. Now, when asked about his opinion about the adult jokes, we get a one-sided shoulder shrug, like, I can't believe this is an actual thing. And then we get a digital flexion when he's talking about the jokes in the documentary. Digital flexion is where the fingers of your palm move in. It's a sign of anxiety about a topic that's being talked about. The farther the draw in, the more anxiety someone's having. And then we see some baton gestures trying to put emphasis on his words and shutter speed. Shutter speed is blinking higher than a high blink rate. And this is done out of fear. He doesn't want to take his eyes off of Boogie as he's saying this was written for a good audience. He wants to make sure Boogie has full focus on him as he's saying these words. And then we get a rise in speech. His brows start to narrow. Was written for a kid audience. He wants you to believe his point by putting some anger into what he's saying. We have some digital reflection here and you can see it better what I'm talking about. And then we have some more shoulder raise where he doesn't believe what he's actually really saying and some baton gestures again. But this time they're different. You're out of sync. Looking back at them 20 years later. Meaning what he's saying is not really genuine. He doesn't believe in it. Then he leads into fading facts. Fading facts is where your speech is really, really high and then it starts to fade. Looking back at them 20 years later through their lens and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And and this happens when your brain kicks in, tells you that, oh, you should stop saying that. Don't say that, it's gonna come back later. You're trying to not emphasize on what you're saying so it doesn't be brought up later on and catch you in a lie. And then his speech picks back up saying he doesn't have a problem with that. But this time we get a shoulder shrug. This one's not a single, this one's a double. This is where things get interesting. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels. A shoulder shrug means one of four things. 
depending on what other gestures going on at the moment. And at this moment, we have a micro shake. He's shaking his head. He says he has no problem with people thinking of a show like this, but as he's saying it, he's shaking his head. Now, for context, put it this way. I want you to describe something you love, something you adore, something you find fun. And as you're describing it, shake your head. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem genuine. It doesn't seem normal. Adding that shoulder shrug with that micro shake, it's a sign of denial and guilt. And then we get the pacifying lip touching behavior, saying that it was very uncomfortable for him to say this or think about this in this way. Now, that last part of the answer, he keeps pushing to cut it from the show like he said he would have done all those years ago if they would have asked. But as he's saying this, he keeps leaning into what he's saying, saying it with confidence. Let's cut those jokes out of the show, just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 years ago. I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like The more people who like the show is the happier I am. Yeah. Now, Dan knows just because he's saying let's cut it from the show, Nickelodeon is not going to cut these jokes from the show. The jokes flow with the episodes. Well, some of the jokes flow with the episodes. Some of the jokes don't even need to be there. And if Nickelodeon goes to cut these from the show, the company will lose money and they don't want to do that. Now, this statement, cut it from the show, washes his hands clean from the adult jokes in the episodes. And he knows this because we get a micro expression of contempt with a smirk, saying, I have the moral high ground now, and this is Nickelodeon's problem, not mine anymore. I got my money. I don't need the shows anymore. We're good. This is your problem. So far, what do you think of Dan Schneider's behavior? Do you think any of it's genuine or do you think he's just being very deceptive and doing this to cover his own skin? I would like to know your opinion on Dan Schneider's interview. This is my first time doing a video like this, so I want to figure out how it's going to come together. I'll finish Dan's behavior profile in the next video. Until then, I'll see you then.